Hey guys, Youngblood with you for the 38th episode of The Inbox, and this time we're going to start off with a question from Ed Average Critic, saying, I plan on running scavenge salvage missions with my brothers. Any chance we might see a large, old, non-operational and decrepit ship, say the size of the USG Ishimura from Dead Space? I understand that would be a huge challenge, but would love the experience of something like that again. So, I don't know what the Ishimura is, I never played Dead Space, but I can tell you that we know for a fact that there are going to be derelicts in space that you're going to be able to run into. Um, the CIG's already talked about the ability to, uh, you know, find a derelict uh, Bengal carrier, um, you know, which is like a kilometer long. Um, actually, I think that grew. Um, I'm mixing up the Dreadnought and the uh, Bengal on the length right now. But either way, massive ships are going to be available to be found. Now, it's not going to be a common occurrence, it's actually going to be very, very rare. That being said, you are going to find that. And you might find a derelict bangle. You might find a derelict aurora. There's going to be stuff just floating in space that you can get out there. And when you find it, you can explore it. You can go through and raid it. You can repair it. So there is a possibility that you could end up walking away with a bangle if you end up finding one. Now, it's going to be a massive undertaking to do anything with it because of the sheer scope of the ship. Not to mention you have to kind of keep that location secret or really well protected. But theoretically, you could bring a convoy of uh, crucibles out there, fix it up, bring in engineers to work on the parts on the inside of the ship and get it up and running. It's going to be a part of the game. The question is how frequent is it going to be and what's the distribution of ships? You know, you're going to find a lot more abandoned auroras and destroyed fighters and things out in the verse as opposed to capital ships just laying around because if you think about it, the military is not going to just leave one of their top of the line, you know, carriers floating around. It's going to be a very rare occurrence. Uh, Ultimate Me says, uh, I was watching your buying clothing in 2.4 video and was wondering if a flight suit is 3,000 credits, what would be the price of a spaceship being credits with the Persistent Universe hits, and will you have the option to buy everything in-game with credits? Yes. The first answer, or the answer to your last question is yes. You have the option to buy everything in-game with credits, with the exception of some very specific military things or classified things. So like an F-8 Lightning, you're not going to be able to buy. You're not going to be able to buy... Um, a bangle carrier. You know, you're going to have to find different ways to actually get some of those pieces of, uh, you know, military type equipment. But for most things in game, yes, you'll be able to buy them with credits. There's nothing you can buy with money now that you can't buy later in game with credits. Now, the question about the credits and what things are going to cost, um, we talked about just a little bit ago in a previous video where uh, Roberts was actually interviewed by Crash Academy and was talking about how things are going to escalate in price in the persistent universe. So, it can be a little bit immersion breaking when you start seeing, you know, a pistol for 10,000 credits and a ship for 30,000 credits. It's like, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But there also needs to be a point in paying the money for clothing when it ends up being that super cheap. So I don't think you can look at anything with pricing right now and say that's what the relationship is going to be. And when we only really have the option to buy clothing and weapons... Um, we have a really hard time trying to figure out what they're going to charge for a ship. Now, we also know that there's going to be a huge dramatic increase in pricing. So even if we could find out that Aurora was going to cost you, I don't know, 100,000 credits, a Super Hornet may be 2 million credits. You know, a big difference in price. So it, there's going to be something there, but until we get cargo in place, until we actually see what the value of a single credit is, um, it's really hard to figure out what these prices are going to be. I could throw some numbers at you, but honestly, we have no idea. Uh, Desert Fox says, uh, if I have a ship such as the Redeemer that is able to carry Marines on it, can I hire NPC Marines to aid me on missions and even when I'm forcefully boarding other players' ships as a pirate? Yeah, NPCs will do whatever you want. Now, you're not going to be able to go to, you know, a police station or some, like, highly lawful area and say, NPC 1, 2, and 3, you're coming with me. You're going to be my boarding crew for piracy actions because NPCs are going to have certain ethics to themselves. You know, if you're wanting a pirate crew, you're probably going to need to go to some shanty bar somewhere picking up a pirate crew that's willing to do whatever. Or you might even be able to put something out on a job board where people can contact you, even NPCs. But you're, it's, there's going to be some nuances to it that aren't just as simple as grab an NPC and go do whatever. Um, the, the, you're going to have to kind of follow like the lore of that individual character. Um, you also say, if uh, I'm on a ship with an NPC crew member, such as a Constellation, and I get boarded, can my crew possibly grab a weapon and help defend the ship? Yeah, um, and that's what a lot of the things that they're doing right now with the... NPCs and subsumption and going through all of the additional development of NPCs. You know, it's not just about them, 
you know, going to work or going to lunch or taking a smoke break. Like, there's more to it. And a lot of it's just making a more intuitive environment. You know, NPCs that'll walk around you on the street. Uh, NPCs that will naturally do things in your ship. You know, if you hire an NPC to be your radar operator, they're not going to just sit there. They're going to actually work the radar, work a turret. So if somebody boards your ship, they're going to help defend the ship. Now, there may be some things you need to do, like say, NPC 1, go guard the rear. NPC 2, guard the middle. I'll take the front. And if we need to converge, we can. There's going to be some things that you can assign out to them. Um, how that ends up looking, we'll have to see. Uh, but yeah, they're going to be dynamic and they're going to be helpful. Uh, Mr. Bach, uh, admire your work. It's very helpful. First, I think we all want to know, how does it feel to be a daddy? Uh, it's awesome. Um, she's a little over uh, three months, like three and a half months now, and it's great. She's very happy, smiley, friendly. I uh, love her to death. Uh, second, when I'm watching your content, I have a feeling that you remember everything about Star Citizen. Have you used some kind of system to absorb new knowledge, or are you just so passionate about the game that it comes more naturally? Best of luck. <laughs> um... I think there's plenty of things that I forget. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot about the game that I remember. Um, I think part of it is just I tend to kind of absorb information fairly well. Um, you know, I, and I think when you're passionate about something, like you mentioned, it's easier to do that. Um, Star Citizen's really interesting to me, and it's something that I just kind of take on and really read as much as I possibly can. And I think even then, there's still a lot of information that I miss or take in and forget. Or you get some conflicting information and you pick one to hold on to, and then you don't remember which one ends up being right. So there's going to be some misinformation. Uh, you know, it's going to happen, but, you know, for the most part, I would say it's just I've got a real interest in it. It's easy to kind of retain it based on that. Um, but yeah, prob that's probably it. Uh, Alejo Ruiz Kamauer says, Do you think the S4 thing on the Buccaneer will be an interdiction gun? If so, how do you think it will work? Uh, we've talked about interdiction in quite a few videos, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on that. Um, specifically about that gun, it's going to be a weapon. Um, and it's going to be, uh, it, it was either going to be the Revenant uh, Gatling gun or it was going to be the Combine uh, cannon. Uh, and it ended up being the Combine. Um, but. I think we know, or at least their plan from CIG, was to utilize the Buccaneer as a, um, a test bed for that type of weapon. So when they get around to testing and implementing interdiction, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a weapon that was available that was size 4 that they specifically planned on using the, on the Buccaneer platform. Now, it would be something you could put on anything that has a size 4 mount. If it ends up being a size 4, it might be smaller, but I think it's a very specific size based on... Um, that ship, I think we can kind of learn because they talked about it being interdiction. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be a little bit down the line, and I think that's why we ended up seeing kind of the uh, contest to figure out which weapon we were going to end up getting uh, because they're trying to do something in the meantime until they're ready to slap on that piece. That's speculative. I don't really know, but that's kind of what you can read into based on the information that we got. Uh, as far as interdiction goes, um, again, it, it might end up being like a preventer where you actually can put up some sort of bubble or screen to prevent people from going. It may be something that you can knock people out of their drive. There's a lot of challenges that go into that, but again, I've talked about it quite a few times, so I'm going to just kind of leave it at that for now. Uh, Marcus Perry, how do you feel about the Loremaker's Guide, and will you be doing star map videos yourself? Because uh, they were better. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of people ask me about this, and I think it was because I, I reacted in a way initially when the videos first came out, that probably wasn't the best, if I'm being 100% honest. Um, I was a little bit frustrated by it. Um, not not big time. I mean, it was more of a joking kind of like, oh, great kind of uh, mentality. Um, but it, the, the bottom line at the end of the day is this. Star Citizen is written by Star Citizen lore makers. And if there's going to be anybody that can do a video that's going to give you more information than anyone, it's going to be coming from the people that are writing the lore. So I think it's great that CIG is actually doing their lore maker series because they're giving us more information than I ever can. Because not only are they using their design posts, which we kind of get through the uh, Galactic Guides, but they're going into kind of the background information. So I think the videos are actually a little bit different. I think mine are kind of speculative about how these systems are going to impact players. I think theirs are more factual and give a little bit more history behind them. So they're, they're a little bit different. Some people like their delivery. Some people like my delivery. It doesn't matter. Um, I think where my frustration initially came in with it was I think it was a good opportunity for them to kind of reach out and interact with the community a little bit more and maybe bring in someone like a content creator to do some of that for them or with them. I have no expectation of that happening. 
I think, and I'm not even saying it could be me. There's other people that do the star map videos as well. Um, but I think there's there was an opportunity there that, you know, it could have been a cool kind of uh, collaboration, um, you know, or even a rotating creator or something like that. But again, I re honestly, I don't care. The videos are so different. They're different places. Um, and at the end of the day, the video, the history, the lore, I mean, all of that stuff comes from CIG. They have the right to do whatever the heck they want, and I'm not going to hold that against them. But I'm glad you like mine. Um, Fire Breather Gaming says, uh, what are your thoughts on the Redeemer as a bounty hunting ship? I will have a crew of three or more players at all times. Should I go with this ship or the Andromeda? And when do you think the Redeemer will be flyable? Thanks. Um, I think the Redeemer is a really interesting choice for bounty hunting. Um, the one thing it doesn't have today is the holding cells. Now, if you've got three heavily armed Marines sitting in the back of your Redeemer pointing at, you know, some machine guns at the person you've got sitting in one of those drop seats, then you're probably fine and you don't necessarily need the holding cell. Or you could put them in uh, handcuffs or just knock them unconscious or something like that. Um, so I don't think that's a big limiting factor, especially considering I think we're going to be getting some modularity for the kind of utility bay in the Redeemer. Um, but we need to see where it's going from there. As far as when do you think the Redeemer is going to be flyable, I don't know. Um, but it's the ship I'm looking forward to flying more than any, so I hope soon. But I haven't seen it anywhere on the roadmap. Um, I guess getting back to it as a bounty hunter, the ship is armed to the teeth. Uh, it's got weapons all over the place. It's a smaller ship with good size shielding. Um, so, I mean, it can lay down a ton of fire, can take a beating. Uh, it should be relatively agile for a ship of its size. And it's got the dropship ability. So whether you're capturing somebody on the planet or on a larger vessel, um, you've got the ability to land and kind of do your thing. So the ship is set up really well to do bounty hunting. The question really comes with how, how prepared you are and what options you have in the game to actually work, uh, I guess, how to apprehend and hold the person that you're trying to transport to whatever justice you're trying to take them to. Um, as far as when... I, again, we don't know. I would I would say probably sometime in 2017, but I don't think it's a real priority, um, especially considering they hired the guy that was responsible for the design of the ship, and he's currently working on other things. And I think they're going to have him actually do the rework because the ship's kind of his baby. Uh, Dragon Templar says, Would the Polaris be a good recommendation for new players that want to command and control the helm of a capital-class vessel? Of course, once we get more information. Um... Yeah, I mean, if you're going to learn how to command a capital ship, the smallest one is going to be the easiest transition. Uh, and with the Polaris being a Corvette, it should be the most, the, the fastest, the most agile of those because it's more of an escort ship. You know, you're really designed to help protect larger capital ships. You're also going to be, um, you know, trying to become more proficient in, um, you know, kind of area, area denial, I would guess, as far as what the ship's going to be. Um, the thing is... I get the impression that the Polaris at, you know, 100 meters, 125 meters, somewhere in that category, um, I get the impression that it's going to fly more like a big normal ship than a capital ship. I think once you start getting to things like the Idris is where we start talking about more advanced options. Like, and they've mentioned this as far as flight goes, you know, the Idris, you're going to have to you know, like plot courses and then the ship will actually do the piloting. So your, your pilot isn't necessarily holding, you know, the stick or the steering wheel and driving the ship. They're more pointing at a screen and saying, take the ship here. Or you can probably do some, you know, take the stick and do some motions on it, but it's big, it's slow, it's not going to move well. You also have more advanced things like managing f fighters that are coming in to land. Um, you also have probably going to be managing the fleet of people that are around you. I think at Idris level is where you see big changes happen in how the ship actually needs to be piloted. So the Polaris is probably a good warm-up, a good practice type of ship, but I don't necessarily think it's going to give you the same experience as, you know, an Idris or a Javelin or a Bengal. All right, and for our patron questions today, we're starting out with one from Shepard. says, uh, STL, I wonder when a player loses all of their ships. Could they play on a planet doing jobs until they can earn enough money to buy a new ship? I'm hoping most planets will have uh, enough to do to keep it interesting, similar to the complexity of Elder Scrolls series, Far Cry series, or the Sim series, but across the entire planet. Um, well, there's going to be a lot of planets where there is nothing going on. Um, that being said... Yeah, I mean, I think that's the that at the end of the day, that's the goal. If you lose all of your ships, you need to find a way to make your money so you can get another ship, and then you can use that ship to start making money towards another ship. Ideally, you keep your insurance and you're not losing anything, but 
Um, there will be jobs on planets, you know, and I think most of the time it's, you're probably going to be best off just jumping in with another player and having them pay you. But yeah, NPCs will help you out. You know, you could probably work in a repair bay and uh, fix up people's ships and earn credit so you can buy another one. Um, I don't know if it's going to be as involved as you could be a busboy, <laughs> you know, waiting tables or wiping down the bar or serving beers. But um, I, there's going to be jobs that you can do on the planet side to help earn money. But again, I think your best bet is to probably jump in a ship, get back into space, fly around, work on other people's ships, um, or even NPC ships, trying to make a, make a dollar so you can get moving on again. As far as just anywhere over the entire planet, um, I don't think you're necessarily going to be out and growing crops and then trying to go to the market and sell it. I don't think it's going to be that involved. You probably need to be in a place where you're actually able to... Um, you know, interact with others, unless you happen to be crash landed with tools that are going to allow you to do like farming or, you know, collection of ore, like those types of things. Uh, and staff at Catherman for our last question today, STL, I know there's not an, um, or I know there's not a lot known about guild mechanics aside from hearing that they'll be doing guild management system at some point. Uh, what I'm wondering is if there will be a cap on how many players can join one guild. Uh, now that CS has mentioned instancing will be greatly reduced I'm sorry, I'm reading bad today. Instance will be greatly reduced and have hundreds, if not more, players in one area. This could allow huge guilds to dominate important regions of resources. I think a cap on guild sizes would be a good thing. What do you think? reason I'm asking is the guild I'm in is very small, and I worry that would be a huge disadvantage once the game goes live. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a realistic concern. Um, I'm not personally in favor of an arbitrary um, you know, cap on organizational sizes because ultimately what you would end up having is um, instead of an organization of 2,000 people and let's say an, a limit is 500 people, you're going to then see four organizations of the same group that are all just technically in different organizations. So like PXP, for example, we've got you know 1,500 people or something like that. You know, if we have a cap at 500 people, we would probably just do PXP A, PXP B, PXP C, and then we would all technically all be within the same organization, even if it's not necessarily recognized in the game. So I'm not necessarily a favor of putting a cap in there because players will always find a way around it. I think there's going to be ways to kind of prevent people from locking down space or trying to, and I think it will happen a little bit organically. Um, one, because people want to challenge, and two, people don't want to be kind of taken advantage of. So if you've got a huge organization that's a pain in the ass in one region, you're probably going to have a bunch of other organizations that kind of form an alliance to take on that other organization that's been causing everybody headaches. Um, you know, I think also if the organization that's locking down that particular region of space is causing, I guess, legal issues um, or just doing things that would be considered against the law in the UEE, the UEE will step in. You know, you'll have, um, uh, you know, like the, the local militia coming in. You'll have the local police coming in. You'll have maybe even the military coming in. Um, those and and the advocacy coming in. Like th there's a bunch of different organizations that fall under the governmental structures of the different systems in the overarching empire that are going to kind of step in and try and regulate their systems. This becomes more problematic in lawless areas. So if you're in a really dangerous system like Magnus or in like maybe even Nix. Um, the local governments aren't going to care as much. It may be UEE, but it's kind of a dangerous area, and maybe the UEE just kind of turns a blind eye to that system. That's where you're going to have more issues, and I think that's where it's going to really depend on um, you know, having good alliances. And I think that's going to be a smart thing to do. If you are in, a, uh, in an organization, and it's a smaller organization, pairing up with other groups, not even necessarily for day-to-day -day operations, but if you guys have something where you need a larger scale fleet to get something done, having people you can call on is important. And th that's something that I think we're going to see a lot of. And I'm hoping something Orgs 2.0 brings is the ability to start forming some of those relationships now because they're going to be helpful at the end of the day. So that's it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, don't forget to get your questions in. We're finally starting to get caught up. Even though some of these say they're about two months out, um, we are getting through the questions at a little bit faster clip. So get your questions in. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. Take care.